coming up on After the Whistle, a look around District 6 baseball and softball. Plus, we head out to the field to see our local lacrosse teams in action. And a big time win from the Nittany Lions men's lacrosse program. All that and more is on the way. After the Whistle starts now. Welcome into After the Whistle. I'm Dylan Price. And I'm Justin Chevalier. The sun is shining all over District 6, but the real shining stars are these players we have here on today's show. Some of them around District 6, some on Penn State teams that we'll get to later in this show. But let's not keep you waiting. Let's get this party started. Our own Joe Callahan Jr. is live from State High for this afternoon's action. Just a few miles down the road. Joe, what's going on behind you? Thanks, guys. I'm live at Community Field as State High is geared up to take on Redland. And it's not the start the Little Lions were hoping for to start their season as they sit at the bottom of the Mid-Penn Commonwealth. But after a tough upset victory against North Allegheny just a week ago, they're looking to take that success into their next stretch of games because four of their next six opponents only have one loss or less. They're looking to take momentum here and from that into those games and make them put their money where their bats are. Back to you guys in the studio. Swing for the fences, Joe. The 2-2-1 two, two, and one Tyrone Golden Eagles hosted the 3-2 and two Phillipsburg Osceola Mountaineers Monday afternoon. Let's take a look at how it went down. Phillipsburg Osceola looked to break a two-game losing streak while the Golden Eagles are coming off a loss to Penns Valley. The Mountaineers were able to strike first off this deep shot from senior TJ Wildman. The ball went wild, but it stayed in the park, and the blue and white were able to draw first blood. Junior Brandon Hahn continued to pile on the lead in the top of the third with this single into the gap, allowing senior Gavin Amig to score from second. Tyrone started the comeback in the middle part of the game, led behind this RBI ground rule double from senior Zach Lagars that trimmed Osceola's lead to five. The Golden Eagles would bring the score to 11-7, but the Mountaineers pull away with five runs in the top of the seventh, including two off this single turned more from sophomore Sam McDonald and a fielding error. Tyrone could not answer back in the bottom of the seventh, and Phillipsburg Osceola wins 16-7 to move on to 4-2 and two on the season. The Mountaineers will head to Belfont to play the once undefeated Raiders on Thursday and Tyrone drops below 500 and they will play Bishop Guilfoyle at People's Natural Gas Field Friday in the Curve Classic. Belfont welcomes Mifflin County to a brand new John Montgomery Ward Field for the Red Raiders home opener. There is that newly renovated field at Governor's Park. It's going to be Dominic Caparella on the mound for the Raider, Red Raiders opposed by Bryson Bubb taking the bump for the Huskies, bottom of the first 0-0 game when Alex Eberling lifts a fly ball to left field. Trevor Johnson will tag from third and score just ahead of the throw to get the Red Raiders up on top, 1-0. Now to the top of the second, still 1-0 when Landon Eichhorn lines one to center field. We watch this one here. The center fielder going to come up throwing for a play at the plate. Just not in time as two runners come around to score and Mifflin County takes a 2-1 to one lead. To the top of the third inning we go. Mifflin County with the bases loaded when Ryan Hine rips a line drive to center field. Two runners easily score on the two RBI double as Mifflin County extends the lead to 4-1. Still in the same inning, Mifflin County just kept piling it on. It's 9-1 to one when Ryan Kennedy comes to the plate. He's going to scorch one back to the pitcher in Peyton Vankis, who makes a nice play on the mound to finally end a seven-run third inning for the Huskies. Belfont in the bottom of the seventh. They had nearly come all the way back. A chance to walk it off with the bases loaded. Braden Kormanek is going to swing at this one and ground it up the middle. Xavier Smith's going to take it himself to second for the unassisted out as Mifflin County staves off the comeback to win 10-8. Belfont drops their undefeated season, falling to 4-1 on the year in their home opener. But they have the chance to rebound against Phillips Osceola tomorrow at home. Mifflin County improves to 3-1 and, and is currently facing the 2-4 Cedar Cliff Colts. Some badly needed renovations came to that baseball field in Belfont, thanks to a million dollar grant. And the project just wrapped up in time for the Raiders baseball home opener. Reporter John Drager shows us what's happening at Governor's Park. The Belfont baseball team is in the middle of a five game road trip to start their season. But by next week, they return home to a new and improved home, John Montgomery Ward Field in Governor's Park. 
We have a very rich baseball history in Belfont. The old dirt field had drainage issues and was prone to flooding, so Belfont's mayor decided to reach out to the state for help. That turned into a $1.1 million grant awarded to the borough through former state senator Jake Corman, who grew up in Belfont. That money was used to build a turf infield, a first in the mountain league, brand new dugouts with connected bullpens for pitchers to warm up, a press box behind home plate, and padding on the back fence. So why the changes? Out of the 10 home games that Belfont scheduled last season, only 30% were played right here at Governor's Park. But with one flagpole, conversations began about renovations to the ballpark. You know, as mayor, the first thing I'm gonna do is get a flagpole out there. And then we got to talking, you know, uh, what, what can we do? After inspections by the contractors this week, the team got to practice on the field with high expectations about the new atmosphere. The environment's a lot better. It seems it's brighter here. The new ballpark brings appreciation from the Boosters Club, including President Dave Caparella. We're thankful for all the people that were involved, um, from Senator Corman to the borough. Another reason for that old baseball movie quote, if you build it, they will come. In Belfont, I'm John Drager for After the Whistle. Belfont hits the road on Friday to take on Huntingdon before returning back to that new field to host Bald Eagle on Monday. Penn State was clashing with their neighbor Delaware State this weekend, searching for their third sweep of the season. Were they able to get it? You see them coming out of the dugout here. That's Kyle Hannon. He's been having himself a season. But this is Bobby Marsh. He singles to center. Grant Norris would come through, and Penn State jumped out to a 5-0 lead. Then in the bottom of the fourth, it's the Elizabethtown PA native Thomas Bramley. He hits a sack fly here, but looking over at third, it's Tyson Cooper. He's ready. He's getting started, and he goes. Cooper, Cooper, and he comes through. Tyson Cooper tags the score, and Penn State goes up 7 to nothing. Starting at the top of the fifth, Robert Trujillo trying to sting the Nittany Lions. Can he do it? No avail. He would strike out swinging, and Delaware State would go scoreless. Penn State leading 7-0. Taven Kelly, the dagger, hits a double to deep center field. And then there's C.J. Pizarro. He's going round, round, get around as he goes all the way through. 10-0 Penn State would go up with this three-run fifth inning to punctuate a game they would win 15-3. They'd ultimately sweep the series against Delaware State. Now the Nittany Lions will travel to Purdue for another three-game series this weekend. That wasn't the only action at Medler Field this week as Penn State looked to grab its fourth straight victory to cap off a nine-game home stretch facing West Virginia on Tuesday. It was military appreciation night as Penn State sported camo jerseys for the game against the Mountaineers. We started out on the very first batter, J.J. Weatherhill doubles to deep center to get the leadoff man in scoring position. And well, the second hitter, Landon Wallace, who you'll see here momentarily, he's going to bring Weatherholt home to make it one to nothing. West Virginia, here goes Weatherholt, rounding third, no play at the plate, and the Mountaineers take the early lead. We move to the bottom of the fourth. It's 5-0 West Virginia when Bobby Marsh cuts in the lead with an RBI double to right to make it 5-1 Mountaineers. Still trying to climb the mountain against the Mountaineers in the bottom of the sixth when Penn State down 6-1. Grant Norris ropes a double to cut the deficit down to 6-3. Penn State would jump ahead 11-6 and with Stephen Miller on the bump to close it out, strikeout looking of Braden Barry and that would complete the comeback victory for the blue and white. With the win, Penn State moves to 18-11 on the season, and after five out-of-conference games in a row, the Nittany Lions finally return to Big Ten play with a three-game set against Purdue this weekend. Our own Logan Barandis was at Tuesday's game, and Logan, things looked scary for a while for the Nittany Lions, but they managed to come up on top. Thanks, Justin. Even after finding themselves in the early hole, the Nittany Lions never gave up. And in a game that even included a very rare inside the park grand slam, they found a way to come back and win it. Let's take a look at how it all happened. Looking to extend a three-game winning streak, the Nittany Lions found themselves in a big hole early on, down 5-0 heading into the bottom of the fourth inning. But with a new uniform to celebrate Military Appreciation Night, the Nittany Lions weren't going to go down easy. After finally cracking the scoreboard in the fourth, Penn State would explode for a seven-run sixth inning, capped off with a Kyle Hannon inside the park grand slam. Penn State wouldn't look back from there, adding three more in the seventh inning to cap off one of its biggest wins of the season. Manager Rob Cooper praised his squad for keeping a level mindset despite the early deficit. 
there's a saying in baseball that momentum's only as good as your starting pitcher, and, and you know that's a saying. And obviously, pitching helps, but I think momentum's only as good as your mindset. You know, if you realize what it took tonight to win, not one guy trying to do it by themselves, playing as a team, playing free and easy, you're never out of it. You baseball players get to the next pitch. That's something you can carry forward. After the fourth inning, the Mountaineers only mustered up one more run the rest of the game. Tommy Molsky, the winning pitcher on the night, said giving the offense a chance was key. Yeah, we've struggled uh, recently giving up runs in tight spots or, or letting a lot tally on in one in one inning, but really just shutting that down and giving our hitters a chance to, to get up and, and retake the lead there was huge. A big force behind the comeback win was a packed house at Medler Field, which saw 2,700 fans. And after a loss in front of that same crowd last Tuesday, Cooper and his team were determined to make it up to the Penn State faithful. It's awesome, and I, I think if you were to ask our guys, you know, obviously we had a great crowd last week too. Uh, didn't play well in our opinion, and, and you know, I know our guys were determined to play better in front of our home crowd, and we did. But in regards to the 5,287 hot dogs consumed on Dollar Dog Night, Cooper bet the under. By the way, I think I was pretty darn close to guessing it. What did I say? I think 51 something. Yeah, I was close. So like on the price is right, I was under, so I would I'd probably move on. Yeah. Well, fans will have one more chance to top that dollar dog night total with the Nittany Lions next home game being played on Tuesday against Youngstown State. Reporting in studio, I'm Logan Mirandis. Logan, those camouflage jerseys were electric, but that hot dog total, hot diggity dog, that is something. Coming up after the break, we dive into the softball world, including a big time rivalry coming to play here at Beard Field. Plus, Penn State men's lacrosse looks to take down its longtime kryptonite and continue their season success. But in the meantime, here are some scores from around the district. Welcome back to After the Whistle, brought to you by Com Radio, Center County Report, and Penn State's chapter of Awesome. Because as we've mentioned in the past, everything's awesome here at Penn State. Well, there was awesome results on the baseball diamond for Penn State, but we're going to move from one diamond to the other. There wasn't a lot of action from the softball fields of Center County, but we do have a doubleheader in the Big Ten. The Ohio State Buckeyes came to town yesterday for a Big Ten softball doubleheader against Penn State. We take you to Beard Field where this happened. First at bat of the game, Bailey Partial after the crowd gets into it. Remember, first of two games between Penn State and Ohio State, Bailey Partial gets the strikeout looking. She had a few of those yesterday. She pitched in both games, but in the top of the third, Molina Wilkinson sends one to deep left, and it's gone. Home run to put Ohio State up one to nothing. And after this celebration, well, those Buckeyes wouldn't stay in their dugout long as Cammie Cordacrex cracks a solo shot to center field to make it two to nothing. There's that other celebration as the Buckeyes go up two to nothing. Now top of the fifth with the bases loaded. Maggie Adi hits one to deep left and it's going to clear the bases. One run scores. There's the second and how about the third to tack it on five nothing. And Ohio State would go on to win nine to five over the Nittany Lions who they try to bounce back in front of a pretty packed crowd in game two. In the first inning it is Quartercracks getting one through the gap to put runners on the corners. Now with the runner in scoring position, Sam Hackenbrack takes a hack at this one. Deep to left field, off the wall. Both runners come around to score as it is now 2-0 for the second straight game for Ohio State. Bottom of the third runner on second, Mariah Rodriguez catches a line drive, throws out Cassie Lindmark at second for a crucial double play. 
which killed momentum for the Nittany Lions. In the sixth inning, though, Maggie Finnegan drives one off the center field line fence, and one run comes around, and with runners in scoring position, still a chance for the Nittany Lions, but Ohio State would end that threat. They'd pile on another run to make it 4-1 to one as they take both games of the doubleheader. Ohio State improves to 25-13 and, and heads to West heads west to face Illinois for a three-game series over the weekend. Penn State falls to 20 and 13 and 2 and 9 in conference play. They'll look to get off the schneid against Rutgers this weekend. Our own Mike Bulger was there to capture the action and, well, grab some foul balls in the process. Let's take a look. The spring season is in full swing, with perfect weather setting up for a perfect day at Beard Field. However, with the Nittany Lions, a perfect day doesn't always set up for a perfect outcome. After going 1-5 on the road against Minnesota and Northwestern, Penn State softball return home looking for a late-season spark against Ohio State in a midweek doubleheader. After going up 1-0 headed into the top of the third, back-to-back -back batters for Ohio State would send solo shots over the fence. Later in the game, the Buckeyes would rally six runs in back-to-back -back innings to take a commanding 8-3 lead. Penn State would attempt to respond, however, it would not be enough for the Nittany Lions after they left nine runners on base throughout the game. Playing the game, having fun, playing loose, and that's what I think everyone on the team is doing for the most part. And, you know, we just got to get those timely hits. And I think we are so close that we're going to get there and we're going to start winning games. Penn State left five runners in scoring position in game one, a stat that would haunt Penn State even with a fresh slate as the night took over. Kylie Lingenfelter would head on to the field to start the game, but yet again, a Penn State ace pitcher fell victim to an Ohio State explosive start. With the Buckeyes up 2-0 headed into the bottom of the first, Penn State would load the bases, but yet again, leave all runners stranded on the diamond. Ohio State would tack on a few more runs and sweep Penn State in the doubleheader. You know, when you look at the teams you're facing, we've got some tough teams, so, uh, but yeah, do we have to get better? Absolutely, starts with me. You know, when, when it comes to hard times, this, this is on me, so but I trust in our team, I trust in our staff, and I know that we're gonna get things turned around. With Rutgers coming to the State College this weekend for a three-game series, the Nittany Lions will need to figure out how to drive in those much-needed runs that are being left on base. Reporting for After the Whistle, I'm Mike Bulger. Penn State softball finishes a six-game homestand when the Scarlet Knights travel from Piscataway for a three-game series starting on Friday. Did State High see a Trojan horse when the 4-1 Little Lions were set to go against the 4-2 Trojans in a big-time District 6 lax match? Let's take a look. Both teams getting ready for the first face-off. This is a big game. Both of these teams do not want to drop this one. And let's see this opening face-off. Momentum on the line. State High gets this one and they will run away from here. Tommy Egger collects the pass, fires this one in. He had five goals on the game. This is Ty Salzar slicing and dicing his way through the crease. This is his first goal of the game. And then another one. Ty Salzar extends the lead to 6-0, to zero, topping off a hat trick. 11-0 was your score at the half. And then adding insult to injury and putting a cherry on top. An own goal from the Trojans would vault the Little Lions to a monster win over Chambersburg. 17-4 would be your final as the Little Lions advance to 5-1 on the season and Chambersburg would fall to 4-3. Johns Hopkins ended Penn State's season a year ago as the Blue Jays moved to 13-4 all-time against the Nittany Lions. Let's head under the lights of Panzer Stadium where that same Johns Hopkins team came to town to face the Nittany Lions. It's number six, Johns Hopkins coming to Panzer Stadium, getting ready to, host not, or to face number eight, Penn State, that is, looking to defend their home turf, but it was a slow start. They're down 5 nothing when Matt Trainer takes the pass from Will Peden and will cut into the deficit. The first goal of the Nittany Lions cuts the lead to 5-1. to one. And then it's Kyle Aldridge dishing it off to TJ Malone, who jukes by two defenders on a pump fake and buries it in the back of the net to tie it up at six. And coming out of half, Penn State would score to go up 7-6, to six, but then it's going to be Johns Hopkins and it's going to be Casey McDermott who gets the goal to, or to Garrett Denging who got the goal to tie it up at 7. Now, fourth quarter, 2 minutes and 30 seconds after the Blue Jays took the lead, Kevin Winkoff ties it at 11 and then watch this. Now in double overtime, Winkoff takes it off of a turnover, gets it, the pass and buries it to send Johns Hopkins home packing. Number eight, Penn State upsets number six, Johns Hopkins, 12 to 11. Penn State gets the thrilling 12-11 victory in front of an electric home crowd.
The Nittany Lions improved to 7-3 and will face number 15 Michigan in Ann Arbor on Sunday. For Johns Hopkins, they'll drop to 9-4 and will host Ohio State on Saturday. Our Carlos Garcia was there as it all went down, and he's here now to tell us more. Thanks, guys. Penn State had a tall task when Johns Hopkins strolled into town this weekend. So how did the Nittany Lions fare against the Blue Jays? Let's take a look. Riding a five-game win streak, the number six-ranked Johns Hopkins Blue Jays ventured into Happy Valley with one goal in mind, claim another victory against a top-ranked team. But standing in their way, number eight-ranked Penn State. After a win against number 14-ranked Ohio State, the Nittany Lions looked to defend their home turf and continue their season's success. But it was Johns Hopkins who drew first blood, jumping out to a quick and early 5 to nothing lead. I thought our guys were executing okay. We just were not playing with a whole lot of passion, you know. Yeah. Johns Hopkins came out on a mission. They were playing with a purpose, and, and they're extremely talented at both ends of the field. For the first time this year, Panzer Stadium hosted Saturday Night Lights, the first night game for Penn State Lacrosse in State College. With a battle between two top eight teams, Happy Valley was in for some fireworks. After back and forth between both squads and a stadium full of fans, it was a storyline for the ages. But in the end, it was an unsung hero who got it done. Senior Kevin Winkoff scored the equalizer with two minutes remaining in the fourth quarter and the game winner in double overtime to stun the Blue Jays 12 to 11. But, but you could see it coming down the fourth quarter and in overtime as a senior. He's got a lot of maturity, a lot of years under his belt and uh, willing to take the shot and right place, right time. And it was a great place to have Kevin standing at the end of that on that ride. The resilience to battle on was present in not only Winkoff's late game performance, but in the teams. Facing a tough opponent and with their backs against the wall, the Nittany Lions roared back and showed why they deserve to be a top five team. So I felt like early we were just trying to figure out if we belonged on the field and then towards the end of the day we, we knew we did and it was just about making it happen and we were just fortunate. I mean both teams had chances at the end so I think we were just fortunate uh, to get a good, great win against a really good team. The Blue and White will look to continue their momentum when they travel to Michigan to face the Wolverines this weekend. Well, thanks, Carlos. I mean, Kevin Winkoff in the spotlight of Saturday night under the lights at Panzer Stadium really took and shined for the Nittany Lions. But that's all we have for this week. Tune in next week for more District 6 sports and Penn State athletics. And hey, keep up with the crew on Twitter and Instagram at ATWPSU for more updates about showtimes and what games we are covering. We will see you next week here on After, After the, the Whistle. whistle.